вчера в этой аудитории происходило обсуждение вопросов о полезности истории для понимания современности. Well, these are the two books which are pivotal for the proper understanding of contemporary life. There were two lectures, one here, the other one in the other room over there, and Fyodor Lukyanov, who was a key speaker there and moderator here, said it's so good to have fewer people in this room because we can have a normal discussion now. Well, there are a little fewer people here than yesterday, but people here are those who are really keen on the subject. Therefore, I suggest we make this an informal discussion and talk about why the history of the Russian finance is first interesting, second topical, and thirdly, gives an opportunity of anyone interested to get involved into this discussion. I suggest that we structure our discussion in the following way. First, I will kick it off with introductory remarks. Then I pass the floor on to Roman Archukin, who is the head of the Russian Treasury. And after he makes his presentation, I will tell you more details about the books themselves and would give you a hint at other volumes and other books that may be less famous, but nonetheless interesting. Uh, after that, I will leave some time for uh, an open discussion and questions and answers. Here we, here we go. The, Academy, the, the Russian Academy, Renepa, used to publish a series of books, the Russian history, in past and present. Nine volumes have been published all in all, and some of them may be available at this time. In those series, we wanted to include some books which are not, not really famous. Some of them are translations from foreign authors. Some of them were hardly ever reprinted. But then, talking to Mr. Mao, I once said that it would be a good thing to uh, to, to launch a sub-series uh, focused on Minister of Finance Aula. And then Vladimir Mao said, look, why should we launch sub-series? Let's launch a separate series, Russian Minister of Finance. That would be a good thing to do. So, so we started. And I invested personal efforts in that. And we nearly agreed on the volumes that are to appear a little later. Well, the rationale behind uh, that idea was that the Ministry of Finance in the Russian em Empire is a thing in itself. It is very special. Even Wikip Wikipedia believes that well, Ministry of Finance was very, very special. And there was a state bank under the Ministry of the Interior, Ministry of Finance, the industrial policy, and other things. Well, since parallelism was a fact of life in the Russian Empire, the Ministry of Empire supervised over finances. And the Ministry of the Interior should be a focus of a separate series, I believe, whereas we shall rather focus on the Ministers of Finance. And with this, I pass the floor on to Romano Chukin. Hello. Hello, dear colleagues. So it is an honor to be present here and this audience to this panel discussion that deals with our great ancestors, people who devoted themselves to the Russian finance and the Russian state. What Renepa is currently doing 
is is a treasurer, is a treasurer and a source of nourishment for our contemporary life. It turns out that the challenges that we, we are grappling with today were successfully dealt with in the past. And the books that we are fortunate to be reading, thanks to Renapa, to Vladimir Mao, and to yourself as a compiler of those volumes, compel us to look back at the outstanding dignitaries, the personalities before this Igor Kankrin and Mikhail Reitern. Uh, these are actually two opposite personalities in the modus operandi and in, in their outlook. The, mm, Igor Kankrin was, was very conservative. He embodied a, the, 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 the state veiled with secrecy. On the other hand, Mikhail Reitern came from a liberal wing of the Russian nobility who was the proponent of accountability and liberal attitudes and who paid a lot of attention to support to private banks, to railways. They were they had brilliant education. They were widely educated and they even indulged in writing verses. And why were these great personalities? Well let me let, let me say that. Just because they were fully trusted, enjoyed trust by the emperor. And every emperor, every great emperor should have the great minister of finance, Nicholas the first and Alexander the second, respectively, in our case. Because they were great. Well, I, I don't know whether um, the word great applies to ministers of finance in the full sense. However, we may recall Vladimir Kovtsov, who after the death of Stalipin, brought together and combined the position of the chairman of the Russian government and the minister of finance. And he took that, or had that office back in 1913. Uh, so, it is so important that the role of a minister of finance should be bolstered by the trust and confidence of the emperor. Us being um, active financial people also take a peek at the research library at the Ministry of Finance, because the library of the Ministry of Finance is was established a long time ago, back under the Russian Empire. Well, here is one illustration of the fact. Well, this is one result of the first of all, brilliant work carried out under Mikhail Reitern, who published back then, we call that published, a, the budget, and that was the distribution of the state revenues and expenditures. This is the exact equivalent of what we now know as the budget. And we believe that well, his predecessors thought that this should be kept confidential, an official secret, because the adversaries and the enemies of the Russian state could make use of that to undermine the security of the Russian Empire. Whereas the Russian Emperor, he says, so be it. Well, this is the actual autograph of the Emperor. And who signed that, that budget? It was not the Minister of Finance, not at all. It was signed by the chairman of the state council. The chairman of the state council actually signed the the budget. Who was the great Prince Constantine? And here's a summary of the state revenue, itemized uh, summary of the revenues and expenditures that was signed by the Minister of Finance of the Russian Empire. 
What can we compare that with? I believe that can be compared with a fundamental budgetary reform under Alexander II. And from that time onwards, where the accountability and the open nature of the state budget, the actual budget and the actual financial statements are officially verified and published. And well, what we now as the accounting chamber of the Russian Federation now had an equivalent in the past. And me, being the treasurer, also can also say confidently that it was under Minister Rayton that the integrity of the cash register was introduced. This is something that was originally introduced under him. All cash registered had been closed before that. And then the, it was all made part of the Treasury under Rayturn. All revenues and expenditures were handled by the Treasury under Rayturn. So coming back to Igor Kankren, before Rayturn, there was no cash register integrity implemented then. However, he recalled that 800,000 rubles were deposited at, uh, at a depository. It was held behind in a safe room with a sentry standing in front of the room, but no one actually knew of where the money had come from. And Kankren was actually asked to collect that money and send back to the treasury. Kankren said, no, everyone has forgotten about, about that. So, but when a war breaks out, the emperor will come to me and will tell me, Kankrin, produce the money, and then I'll have the money handy. This is something totally impossible now. There are no sep separate stashes, no purses, nothing, no, nothing stashed away someplace. Everything is deposited on integrated um, deposit account of the Russian treasury. However, Igor Kankrin, uh, actually, well, devised a stash of a kind under the Russian Empire. So we can say now that the activities of our previous Russian finance ministers find a reflection in our current financial operations. I should also mention some of the works by Yegor Kankran. Well, if you cast a fresh look at them, we can find that they are, they have a distinct noble style of narration. I cannot hold back uh, reading out an excerpt from one of his books and some, some or rather a few excerpts on the ordinary um, of officials at the Ministry of Finance the economy of financial organization, the way the national wealth should be distributed. That, should, that, that was something predecessors of the so-called national accounts. And he's writing about what should the remuneration of an ordinary worker should be. The minimum for a common worker should cover his subsistence second some surpluses that he will require to repair his tools, keep his animals, and bring up their children, then some savings for the future, for the old age, and some special profits, something that would manage him to improve his wealth or raise a capital. This is one example of why and how a financial system in a state should be set up and how it should be structured. If we realize that we are living in a wealthy and prosperous state, we should also realize that common workers like Count Kankren used to write should also be wealthy and prosperous. I, I'm so happy that this book is already in the pipeline, it will soon be published, and it, it is available. And Mikhail Rayturn 
We, the, a book about him is also available. And the new generation of financial people at the Ministry of Finance and other state departments can have a fresh source of knowledge and inspiration. Thank you for this opportunity to be here, to be with you. Thanks again. Colleagues, let me do this. Let me tell you a little more about uh, those books and about uh, the protagonists. Uh, from the outset, I want to mention that these books are available in kiosks on the ground floor and on the fifth floor. And so if anyone's interested, please feel free to buy them. Ken Crin is a curious figure, you know, because he, for, if only for his longevity, he held the office of the Minister of Finance longer than others. Well, Zverev and Garbozov used to be the champions under Soviet times. However, back prior to that, Kankrin held his office the longest. And he joined the world of finances from a military position. So he was like kind of a paramilitary or military financial officer. He, he was of the German extraction. And he had some hard time in launching his career because he started with a high position. Whereas in the Russian Federation, if you had a high rank, then your position could not be below that rank. So it was difficult for him because no ranks were available. Uh, no, no positions were available that would match his rank. We can recall Abraham Peretz in this context. We all know that, well, where is salt and there's Peretz. Peretz, whereas the Peretz is the equivalent of pepper. So Abraham, Abraham Peretz suffered from uh, the discriminatory action of the state next to government and military procurements because the Minister of Finance paid him late. Uh, although he was owed millions of rubles by the state, he had about one million owed, uh, uh, owing to his suppliers. So he had to declare himself bankrupt, and Kankrin used to be an accountant to Abraham Peretz. So Kankrin went to serve uh, in the military, and I believe there is little details are available, but he was engaged in the military procurements of the Russian army during Napoleonic Wars. And um, less money was spent on the Napoleonic Wars than previously expected. That was one good thing. Secondly, so when the Russian troops marched across Europe, Kankrin procured them in such a way that he minimized costs. And he supplied foodstuffs to special distribution centers. And this is what historian Levin is writing about, this fundamental work on the Russian Napoleonic Wars. And so when allies actually build them, invoice them, because they were happy that the Russian Tsar could actually topple Napoleon, but they invoice the Russian army for staying in Europe. However, Kankrin managed to reduce the bill from 600 million rubles to 60 million rubles only, just because his paperwork was in impeccable order. And that German uh, love of Ordnung um, benefited him. Nicholas I summoned him and said, well, they say, the rumor goes that you stole 8 million rubles. Is that true? He said, no. Not 8 million, 14 million rubles. And on the following day, he produced all the paperwork 
uh, documenting his revenues. His successes in procurement and finances, first of all, they gave him military positions because he became a general. And he wrote a book that now is part of this book. Uh, it's been translated into Russian for the first time, the book about uh, the world economy and uh, treasury. And finally, that convinced the emperor um, and maybe uh, the support provided by Barclay de Tolle also played a part in it. Uh, he was a relative of Barclay de Tolle. But anyway, Kankrum became Minister of Finance. In this book, the introduction was uh, written by a group of experts, including Chris Monte. He is an American. He now works in uh, South Korea in, uh, at the university in Seoul. Two articles about concrete that uh, are contained in this book. It is part of uh, um, his thesis that was defended several years ago. It is one of those uh, um, cases, they are not very rare, unfortunately, when a foreign expert knows the Russian history better than us. So his articles, uh, of course, they are worth reading. Kankrin, as a classic minister of finance, he was uh, a promoter of strict economy. Nikolai, uh, with uh, his uh, successor, was uh, ironizing that uh, it is much easier with you uh, because uh, the previous Minister of Finance was never given me what I wanted. Whatever I would ask of him, he was replying that I have no money. So the successor of Concrete was uh, giving away money for uh, all kinds of expenditure, and of course it was not uh, to the benefit uh, for the Russian economy. So Kankrin was uh, a contradictory character. On one hand, he was uh, a conservative, of a conservative uh, disposition, but on the other hand, in another book, gives us uh, some facts witnessing that uh, Kankrin, on one hand, was against private banks, saying that uh, they are frauds. On the other hand, uh, he was helping some cash registers of financial institutions because he thought that that will support uh, small businesses very well. As to railways, he indeed thought that it is too early to develop railway network in Russia because we have nothing to carry. But uh, anyway, he was part uh, he was uh, participating in the committee that was uh, engaged in building railway from St. Petersburg to Moscow. So anyway, he was, uh, of course, facilitating the development of our economy and uh, the Ministry of Finance. His successors were much weaker and paler, if I may. And Ken Crean, uh, he's uh, the character that I personally think is underestimated. So this book that we have published, I hope uh, it will become uh, an important collection of papers and articles that will allow us to uh, recognize the legacy of this statesman. Another thing about Kankreen, sorry for going back, I already was commented that uh, you couldn't read through the uh, content and the, uh, the names of chapters of the book. Uh, the content wasn't published on the site. And mm. So uh, you can look at the content here. The books will be available on this table. Feel free to come up and uh, uh, cast a glance at them. One more thing about the article on the financial policy. It is uh, available on the website. The name of the article is, uh, was it, could Pushkin pay out his debts? Uh, 
Kankren being the Minister of Finance, he tried to uh, alleviate uh, the debt of Pushkin to help him out with his debts. On one hand, he was uh, providing some benefits to Pushkin. On the other hand, in his uh, reports to Nikolai, he was uh, presenting the situation, showing that uh, there are no problems there. And that allowed uh, him to provide resources to Pushkin. But anyway, when Pushkin was killed, uh, the Treasury had to pay out his debts. But nevertheless, uh, we had to recognize that Kankreen, although he was quite a strict statesman, he was uh, very tolerant towards Pushkin. And for example, back in the Russian Empire, there was a there was a duty uh, on hand, uh, for handicapped people, and uh, these duties were used uh, to, to to support uh, handicapped people, and uh, that duty was not uh, applied to Pushkin, but uh, made it very discreetly, and uh, that was not uh, that was uh, not noticed by Nikolai. Raytern was another prominent character. He was a graduate of uh, uh, Tsarskoe Silo Ly Lyceum. Not many people w actually graduated from that institution. Kakovtsov wa was another prominent graduate. Of course, he did it in a different, uh, in different time, and um, maybe at that time professors were less liberal than uh, in the previous period. But anyway, I think that uh, that uh, institution maintained uh, a more liberal style comparing to other educational institutions. So he was in one intake year with Golovnin. And uh, that one became a counselor to the emperor. I think that uh, Raytern was first invited, uh, with the support of Golovnin, uh, to become a servant of uh, the state right after he graduated from the Lyceum. He was invited to serve at the Ministry of Navy. And he was right away sent to other countries for a business trip, long business trips. He was in Prussia, in the United, to the United States of America. And there he learned, of course, how the financial systems of other countries operate. And of course, that helped him a lot in the future. He had a very clear vision of how the financial system should be structured, how to do it correctly. There is one work by Rayton. I understand that you cannot read uh, from the screen. Uh, I'm sorry for that. But again, feel free to come up and glance, cast a glance at the content uh, in the book. So there is this work that uh, it wasn't forgotten. No one ever m mentioned it, I think. So, it was in his uh, list of works, but it was never highlighted. It is about uh, the influence of uh, the work of economists on forming capitals, human capital. I think that the experts on human capital will uh, agree to me. I wrote uh, that part of the book. I think that, in fact, uh, Rayton is uh, either a precursor or maybe even one of the founders of the theory of human capital. He says that the that education and uh, the character of the nature of the, a person's activity uh, actually shapes the economy of the country. It, it was unthinkable back in the 19th century, but that was a deep conviction of Rayton. I tried to prove that in my article. Another interesting thing 
Rayton, I think he was the first to pose a question to uh, start discussing uh, the shadow economy. He said that uh, there is official economy and unofficial economy. The official economy, official household economy is what uh, is uh, known to the state, to administrative institutions. But at the same time, vast uh, groups of populations, population, they are engaged in unofficial activity that is not known to any official institution, but that actually helps people to maintain their, their activity, their households. Rayton explains that as follows. The government, instead of uh, exercising its main function, instead of uh, protecting property, uh, instead of that, it is engaged in uh, some petty protectionist activities. He cites an example. It is from Arkhangelsk. Several, he says that uh, several years before uh, a merchant could uh, trade without establishing the order of trade himself. But then a regulation was implemented and uh, a captain had to pre-approve where he goes on his ship, where what he buys and uh, where he's going to sell the goods. What are the consequences? The consequences are that uh, right now Russian merchants are getting, are carrying their freights under English flags. So the merchants, they continue being engaged in trade. But unfortunately, our northern free fleet lost huge uh, turnover. So that article, that paper was published in the the newsletter, the news publication of. Uh, the Navy, back in the time, it was the only publication, the only periodical uh, that was published at the time, and maybe it's one of the oldest uh, in Russia. And we can find uh, articles of by Rayton there. He had many interesting articles on uh, English and French uh, accounting systems. And he says that, for example, uh, the French accounting system uh, actually is uh, based on strict economy and uh, economists are paid uh, low salaries there. But English accounting system at the same time, uh, it, is, it is based on, uh, bet on better trust to economists and they're paid better salaries, salaries and uh, that makes it possible for more educated and more experienced people to work there, and the system benefits from that. At that time, the Crimean War happened, and uh, that, of course, highlighted all the problems of the uh, brilliant administrative structure created by Alexander I. It was clear that uh, changes are needed. Tuchev uh, introduced a new term, glasnost, public availability. It was clear that uh, changes are needed. There were organized uh, working groups that were working on preparing the reforms, and uh, everyone understood that it's better to implement reforms uh, from top to bottom, and uh, reforms are either implemented uh, with the help of the leader of the country or were not implemented at all. Rayton could only implement all those reforms uh, with the support and uh, um, thanks to the trust from the emperor. Of course, uh, Valuev, his predecessor, was uh, his competitor. They were presenting their reports to the emperor on Fridays, and Valuev always uh, was commenting that he, that uh, Rayton uh, abuses 
the trust from the emperor, but it is true in a way because without the trust uh, on the side of the emperor, Rayton would never be able to do what he would know would, would never have done what he did. His reforms uh, helped to reshape the economic policy of the government. The program prepared by Rayton, it actually structured the policy of, uh, of good and uh, productive ministers of finance. Well, what was he saying? He said that uh, we need to stabilize the budget. What does it mean? We need to cut on expenditures and increase our revenues. What can we do to re increase revenues? We need to export more wheat. How to do that? We need to build a network of railway. We are lacking internal resources to build a, a railway network. We need uh, more metal, so we need foreign investments. Foreigners will not uh, come just like that. We need to provide them with guarantees. So we need to provide guarantees for the capital they are investing. At the beginning, those guarantees were quite substantive. We were basically guaranteeing the revenue almost independently on the quality of the investment on, and on the quality of the investment management. But that was uh, that was a way to break the ice of, uh, of lack of trust and uh, to attract big capital to Russia. So that was one of the reasons why Reutern was strictly against Russia's engaging in military operations. So he was opposing the uh, Russian-Turkish war. He was uh, uh, he was trying to resign several times, and uh, he was uh, in bad uh, on bad terms with uh, Milutin, the minister of uh, war. Brighton was proving, trying to prove that uh, we need to improve our relations with European cars. Oh, sorry, European uh, states, and he was. Uh, he was trying to prevent procurement for military operations and uh, um, nevertheless the military people thanks to his, their military successes were managing to get financing for military operations but nevertheless Rayton made uh, it possible for the Russian budget to become uh, to become to get rid of uh, the deficit by the end of the 19th century. But then uh, the results of the Russian-Turkish war unfortunately reversed the success. So you can find all that uh, information in many papers. But there is information that is not uh, that well known. Breton was uh, participating in pr providing and producing concessions uh, in terms of the railway network building. Why the concessions were needed at the time? Uh, as uh, that was deemed to be profitable business, the shareholders of the railway were selling their shares. And thanks to that revenue, they were compensating their investment. And, uh, late, and then it was uh, even not that important whether the construction of railway was uh, profitable in the end or not, because they were receiving their revenues at the very beginning. So Return was bored with being involved in that, of being an impediment on the way to the request for more and more concessions, because all, con all concessions were guaranteed by the state. So there were so many applicants, so many people who wanted to, to, to acquire concessions. And then the emperor had the final say as regards the con concessions, and his spouse played an important role in that. So, Ray turn drafted special regulations, separate tra set of regulations, and that was for the first time in Russian history, when he offered a new procedure for 
issuing concessions. And he suggested that concessioners would file their bids before a final decision was made by the emperor. That was the first effort to curb the corruption. And for the first time, we published a document here, which is, which is titled, uh, well, this is basically a memorandum on concessions, which was never published before. There is another memo on the restriction of the use of officials in railway concessions. And in that memo, uh, Raytern writes to the emperor that this is this has become a widely used tool of enrichment, and many reputable people have become involved in this process, and they're, tr they're trying to put some pressure on the decision-making process. So it would be so good if the emperor could actually make it known that uh, dignitaries and officials uh, should not be involved in the joint stock businesses set up. The emperor agreed, but the whole thing never worked because the emperor himself oftentimes conceded that top officials were involved in concessions. Likewise, well, the, the, that integrated cash register never worked as originally planned because stashes were still there. And Raytron said, I received the consent of the emperor, so 1,400,000 rubles were stashed away and put aside for two banks, for one for a construction project, the other for the Nova Silsa Bank, and the state controller couldn't do anything about that. Of course, there were some rules were bended, rules were stretched. However, these are two different things. The absence of any rules is one thing. So when they stretch a rule, that's a totally different thing, because the rule is still there. So a person who resigned as a sign of protest against war expenses certainly merits our respect, and the emperor asked him to stay, to stay. and Raytern agreed, and he stayed. He revoked his resignation because that was a hard time. But as soon as they made peace, he resubmitted his resignation, and he eventually resigned. And this is something which, which deserves our recognition and our respect. He never raised the capital holding that office. And when he resigned, he asked for some subsistence, subsistence uh, from the government. And he asked for an amount of uh, timber and woods that would provide him with ongoing revenue. Whereas other officials like Todes, they calculated the price of tinder in such a way that Return eventually received an enormous wealth of one million rubles. But in return, he offered other officials be rewarded appropriately. And Return also said that, well, that was too much, and he cannot receive a donation from the emperor that was not properly calculated. So there were uh, different versions of the story, one that he was given 100,000 rubles, the other 400,000 rubles. but. The fact remains that uh, Minister Aitern refused to accept an improperly calculated benefit. 
This is something that really merits respect. This is something very unorthodox in the Russian history. So, colleagues, of course I am so engrossed in this subject, and I can talk about this for ages. However, I feel compelled to stop at this point. I will just say a couple of words about our plans for the future. And I will then be happy to take your questions, if any, or Roman Arjukin will take your questions, if any. So, our plans are these. We will be publishing two books which are in the making. One book will be, we will cover the life of an outstanding minister of finance by the name of Kokovtsov. He is normally pictured as a technocrat, as a as a sole administrator. But this person administrated finances for so many years and so successfully that this deserves our study and our interest. I would be happy to publish uh, some materials that have not been published before. The other uh, volume will be on Alexei Kudrin, and I hope this book will appear next year. This series is planned for a long period of time. And any outstanding minister of finance can be included in this series. So the definition of outstanding needs to be properly defined. Kokovtsov is certainly outstanding. There's no doubt about that. And there is one other incident uh, that um, about him that I should mention in the current context. When Stolipin was assassinated, and that collusion still remains obscure, and uh, while well, the police officers investigating and providing security for Stolipin also remain obscure. However, those people who supported Stalipin came to visit Kokovtsov and said that we will keep supporting your political line if your political line will be consistent with that of Stalipin. Kokovtsov said that the political line in our state is only pursued by one person, whereas everybody else is implementing the political line devised by that person. And, well, um, the more latitude, the more office a person is granted, the sooner he loses trust and confidence once the crisis is over. So I'm not going to pursue any political line other than the line devised by the Russian emperor. So I will not follow your suit. So whether this is good or bad is not for me to say. For instance, Mr. Zverev, who used to be a finance minister for a long time, has always been in the shadows, somewhere backstaged during the Soviet era but in particular. He published his memoirs, in, it is true, but they're totally bleak. Well, they, 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 they make no sense. Yes, there's no, no option for him. There's just one interesting um, part of the memoirs as to how they calculated the exchange rate of the rubles when the monetary reform was in the pipeline under Stalin, and they spent days and nights calculating the consumer basket, and they found an equivalent to the American tweed coats, um, like the, the, the army trench coats. And then they sent everything to four 
the approval of Joseph Stalin, and Joseph Stalin crossed out everything, and he uh, made a note that the one U.S. dollar should be equivalent to 55 kopecks, 0.55 rubles, that is. And uh, that was so much for their efforts and for the midnight oil they burnt. Uh, however, there are so many interesting facts still hidden in the archives. And you, yes, let me let me tell you more about this right now. Okay, never say never. There can be so many stories hidden someplace and waiting to be divulged and revealed. I was so happy to know that two of our colleagues will be the main characters, the protagonists of our next volumes. So we're all open to your ideas, to your suggestions. I can leave you my phone number and my email address. So please feel free, because this is a sign of the true patriotism, one we learn from our history. Thank you. Thank you. On Soren, uh, uh, thank you, Andrei Katovich, and because your efforts, your efforts are very well noted, and we can see and witness that level of love you put into your work, something that is reflected in your excellent volumes. Please do not stop doing that. Well, of course, we need a volume on Zverev after a volume on Mr. Kovtsov uh, uh, and Burger too. Well, and young researchers, if you plan to become a finance minister, why don't you start writing in the same vein? Because we, you, we, you need to produce more than memos. Oh, please keep writing, keep publishing your uh, articles, your papers. So what comes to Zverev? So uh, oftentimes we put our research activities aside to our everyday official work, because th that would deflect our intellectual resources. And officials are fully concentrated, are fully focused on the tasks at hand, on the routine tasks at hand. However, well, Ministers of Finance oftentimes indulged in some literary activities and the work. So we sent a request to Ross Archives to Andre Archerzev, and he supported us in declassifying the files on, on the Ministers of Finance during wartime. We are um, now preparing publications jointly with the Harris School of Economics that would actually make available new information and new data. We will, um, we will give you copies of these archive materials as a gift, and you will then be able to work on them and produce some more books on them. And then you will be able to see the brilliant way the financial system of the country was reorganized. And the financial predicaments, the trials and tribulations we lived through later in the 20th century also merit our attention. There may be a book on Mr. Pavlov, the Minister of Finance, in the early years of independent Russia. Well, who could not preclude the tumultuous change in the financial system, unlike Zverev, who managed to keep all current payments, and all payments were in place. And he admitted the operation of the black market. Why so? Just to, to sterilize the excess money supply so that it would then be sterilized through the profiteers who amassed a lot of a, a lot of cash on hand so 
I believe that the Ross Archives would be giving us a helping hand in the future and we'll get more materials to study and to work on. Please do not stop. Please don't. And for our part, we, we will be helping you for sure. So uh, and any questions, any comments from the audience at this time? We do have some time left. Oh, if I may. Well, there's my deputy sitting here, Mr. Prokofiev, the Treasurer of Russia. And he keeps working hard on keeping the memories of the Minister of Finance. So perhaps you could say a few words on that. Why don't you use the microphone, please? The Ministry of Finance and the Russian Treasury both have special councils on history matters. And the History Council of the Ministry of Finance used to be headed by Anton Siluanov for quite a long time. However, this is a very active body of administration, and they're engaged in implementing a whole series of projects, which Roman Archukian mentioned in his remarks. I'd like to tell you a little more about that. Uh, Pushkin used to said about the love for uh, the Russian caskets for the Russian dead. And we have history councils and the graves of our leading financial luminaries were all identified by us through a monumental historical efforts. We put them in order, and while looking after that, the Ministry of Finance and the Treasury, that is. And three years ago, we fully revamped and restored uh, the grave of the first head of the Russian Treasury, Count Alexei Vasilyev. And we even introduced an award, the Vasilyev Medal at the Russian Treasury. And we have a bust of Vasilyev, the only one in this country that was made and installed in the main lobby of the Russian Treasury. Uh, that used to be a mortuary. It was originally made by the great sculptor by the name of Martens, the necropolis at the Alexander Nevsky Laura. And we also put two other graves in order of the prominent people who never held the position of the Minister of Russia, though, or Minister of Finance of Russia, though, but who still await to be properly recognized. One is Venemin Tatarinov who was the originator of the state financial control system. So, Rayton's plan was based on the groundwork created by Benjamin Tatarinov. And we also talk about the grave of one other great financial person, Mikhail Spiransky. We've restored it and uh, we are taking we are maintaining the tube. He was the author of uh, the cash register integrity plan, and that is the basis of uh, our treasury system operation as of, uh, up to the present time. The researchers hasn't yet fully studied this work, and uh, of course uh, we hope that we will be able to publish this work. This year, we celebrate 100 years anniversary, anniversary of, uh, of Count Conkrin. We have fully restored his tomb, not far from St. Petersburg. The Ministry of Finance supported these works. Roton was buried not in Russia. He is buried in uh, 
Latvia, we cannot do much uh, about his tomb, but nevertheless, we work work on that. So we do that. We are also digitalizing archives. Uh, you already mentioned military archives. We also have uh, archives on the history of revolution. We've recently published four volumes on the history of the Ministry of Finance. We published uh, a two-volume work on the history of the Treasury of Russia. So we go on studying all these uh, matters uh, together with researchers, with scientists of Russia. Now, speaking about uh, Mr. Kakovtsov, Roman Evgenovich uh, is a very, very uh, shy person, but he uh, personally published uh, many works uh, with his own money. And right now we have a, um, a plate on his house that is commemorating his name. The archive of uh, Kakovtsov uh, is uh, in the National uh, Library in Brussels. Unfortunately, we uh, haven't managed to bring it back to Russia. But uh, nevertheless, we um, work together with the uh, Russian archive service, with scientists, with the Ministry of Finance. And we've managed to uh, digitalize, to uh, transfer to the, into the digital format uh, his archive. We are sure that we cannot go into the future without studying the past. Dear colleagues, do you have any questions? Any comments? I would like to thank you for, for your contribution. Indeed, taking care of tombs, uh, in fact, uh, in this way we pay tribute to our past. I remember that uh, there was this episode in the history uh, escapes were uh, retreating uh, while um, having a war with their enemies and they say that oh you're cowards you're retreating constantly but they said that well you know we are retreating because we need to retreat at this moment but uh, if you touch uh, a tomb of our ancestors you will know what cowards we are you will see what will happen to you so and that is the proper attitude to the tomb of ancestors and uh, as to Kakovtsov I I couldn't find a sign pointing to his tomb. I had to spend some time. And unfortunately, last time when I was in Paris, I haven't found it. And uh, I couldn't even find the tomb of uh, Georgi Ivanov. Uh, Ten years ago, I was there and I uh, visited his tomb. But in, in France, uh, it, it works um, very simply. If you do not pay for the tomb, uh, the tomb will be removed. And that is why on our Russian uh, cemetery, we are already seeing French tombs. And we are, uh, we unfortunately are being displaced. So uh, back at the time, we were paying for our tombs. But th then uh, there were some disruptions and uh, payments. and. Once uh, Putin, Mr. Putin was brought to the tomb of, I, I think that was Vera Polenska, and uh, he was going to see this tomb of a Russian emigrant, and uh, he made uh, in order to continue to uh, go on paying for tombs because. Uh, for example, the tomb of uh, Merzhkovsky, it was paid for, and uh, there was no money for the tomb of his wife. And uh, there is just a small plate next to his tomb stating the date of birth and death of his wife. So 
if uh, we see that we have an initiative uh, and a movement to maintain tombs, um, well, considering that uh, this year we we are going to uh, mark the 100 years, years anniversary of uh, of our statesman, uh, let us uh, go and see what is the state of uh, their tombs. We know where the uh, tomb of Freighton is. In Latvian sources, uh, it is marked. It is there in the register, and we know how to get to that place. It is um, a couple of hours by car, so we can do something about it. Well, anyway, colleagues, if uh, we don't have any questions or comments, then uh, I have nothing but thank to do but thank you for coming so early for our session, and uh, I do hope that uh, we will continue our work. Thank you very much. The books are available here. Please come up and uh, take a look.